My name is Arlene Hurston. The name of the show is Getting to Know You, and that's exactly what we're going to do. Tonight, we're going to get to know a man who is a thoroughbred in the world of entertainment. World-renowned, his exuberance for life is exceeded only by his major talents as an actor, singer, dancer, and author. He has jockeyed his position in show business to one of the most respected. In Golden Boy and Mr. Wonderful, he wowed theater audiences. In Porgy and Bess, Robin and the Seven Hoods, and Ocean's Eleven, including numerous others, movie audiences cheered him. Candyman, What Kind of Fool Am I, Bojangles are among his recording classics. He has battled adversity, prejudice, and personal tragedy to emerge as a winner and a true champion. A man I am proud to have as my guest. He is Sammy Davis Jr., and let's get to know him. Welcome. <laughs> Well, you know, it was an elaborate introduction, but I have to tell you, I've always been an admirer of yours as a performer. But now, in learning about you and doing the research, I'm also very much an admirer as a person. We take for granted someone who's a star always was a star, and things came easy for them. Obviously, it was not that way for you. You had tremendous obstacles to overcome. But I'd like to take you back to the beginning a little bit, because you started on the stage at the incredible age of two years old. Mm -hmm. Can you just share with us your first memory of being on the stage? Mm, uh, it's very hard, Arlene, because I'll tell you the reason why. It's, uh, <clears throat> as one gets older, it uh, sort of all merges <laughs> together. It's, uh, the fates are very kind that way. Uh, but I remember as a kid, you know, a young kid being in show business, and it was an elitist sort of a lifestyle. Because I got a chance to stay up later than other kids, you know. And I wore long pants when everybody was running around in short pants. And guys like the Nicholas Brothers and uh, the Berry Brothers and Donald O'Connor, who were all in vaudeville at one time or another, we would always run into each other. So those, those guys were sort of like the playmates. Uh, in later years, I, I learned to miss uh, all the things that I had missed as a child that every other person takes for granted, you know, playing baseball and roller skating and bicycling and, needless to say, schooling and all of the rest. But as far as show business was concerned, that was an adventure and it was, it was fun and it was learning and it was learning your craft, although it wasn't, it was like a game. It was like a gigantic game that you got applause for, you know. <laughs> okay, when you say learning, your, your talent is tremendous. How did you learn to sing, to dance, to act, to do impressions, to play musical instruments? Who taught you? <clears throat> well, most of it I just picked up. And uh, the supportiveness that performers have for one another, that thing that a lot of columnists, uh, you know, pick on about people huggy, kissy, poo, and all of that jazz. Uh, that, that affection goes back many years ago, because well, you could walk up to a performer in the old days and say, hey man, how do you do that, you know, and they said, oh, you mean this step? And they'd show you how to do that step. Uh -huh. Or I remember walking up to Buddy Rich and asking Buddy, uh, what do you do when you hold the sticks in your hand? How do you hold them, you know? And he said, this is the way you hold the sticks. He said, see if you can play this. He says, you dance, right? I said, yes. He said, play this. And I went, and he went, uh-huh, he says, okay, you'll be able to play drums. But that's, I only brought that up to illustrate the, uh, the points of the camaraderie that made it easier. And we didn't, we had neither the time nor the money to go to class as kids go today. Yeah. So if you wanted to learn to act, you watched movies, you know, and... If you were on vaudeville shows, you watched the other performers that were on the bill, because that was one of the prerequisites my dad and Will would always say to me. You watch that guy, boy. Watch them all. You know, and that I did. And have become a movie buff, and as a matter of fact, your second book, your first book, was really an autobiography, yeah. uh, Yes, I Can, by Sammy Davis Jr. Your second book was kind of talking about your, your love for the movies. Oh, yes. But you said you learned from, from doing from experience, from being around all those wonderful people, but... You never went to school. You never even spent one day in school. No, that's, that's probably the greatest regret that I have in my life. And I had no formal education. Uh, it is imperative, you know. And even though I was lucky enough to miss the technological age that we're now in, but uh, 
at my age, you can now rest and say, well, I did it, but I got past it. But uh, it's a different time and a different place in education. As it was then, it's even more important now. Yeah, you know, and, absolutely. You know, and I say to all young people in this business that want to be in show business and have a talent for it, that's marvelous, and love it and honor it, but get an education because, boy, without it, you, you just, you're floundering. You know, you really are. Because I had to learn. Of course, everything I learned, I cherished because I learned the hard way. But there's got to be an easy yeah. way. <laughs> okay, but how did you avoid the truant offices in those days? I mean, it was a law that you had to go to school, and you... Well, I didn't, school? but my dad and uncle were very clever. The CIA had nothing on them, <laughs> you know. They, they found that Secret Service, you talk about, they had tunnels and things to get you in and out. But uh, it wasn't an unjust life uh, in terms of uh, a kid working in show business. He was... As a matter of fact, I think that most of us who worked in show business in those days uh, was really, we had it better off than anybody because we got three square meals a day and we got to bed early and, and uh, the recreational periods were like this and everybody was supportive in terms of the older people around you to make sure that you didn't stray off the, you know, the good path. So I think that we were, we were, if anything, we were overly protected. Yeah, well, it sounded like a great life in, in reading your book. Quite frankly, I didn't want to go to school either. I would have rather <laughs> been doing what you were doing. <laughs> we're going to take a break, and then we're going to find out more about the life of Sammy Davis Jr. So right. please stay with us. We're here at Harris Marina Hotel in Atlantic City with my very special guest, Sammy Davis Jr., and we'll be right back after these messages. We're back. We're with my very special guest, Sammy Davis Jr. We're here at Harris Marina's Hotel in Atlantic City. We were talking about the old days, actually, of your yeah. being on the road, uh, traveling with your father and lifelong friend, Will Maston, yes. who, who you called your uncle. But your parents divorced when you were two. Yes. I read in your book that you met your mother when you were around four and you didn't know who she was at that time because you were actually living with your father on the road. Yeah. Did you ever get to know your mother? Did oh, you yes, yes, in later years. <laughs> By the time I was 10 or 12, I got to know her very well. And uh, funnily enough, my mother is right here in the hotel now. Oh, terrific. And uh, it's, a, it's a strange relationship. And I think it's stranger to read about it than it is in actuality. But in terms of separations of parents, if there's great love on both parts of the parent, a separation if can be for the good of the child as opposed to if they're separate personalities and the marriage is beyond repair, then I would feel that better for the child that the parent should separate but still maintain a uniformity in terms of the point of view of the child or the children, meaning that in my case, I had the love of both parents, continued to have the love of both parents. And w my dad never played one upsmanship against my mother, and my mother never did that against my father. So there was great respect that I had for both of them. So that there was no, that's the mean lady or that's the mean man sort of syndrome. Yeah, okay, I agree with you 100%. I do not believe people should stay to bed together if they don't love each other you know, and want to be together. That old cliche about Absolutely. for the children, we're keeping Absolutely. it together for the children, that's, yeah. that's ruined a lot of young men and women. Right, I agree with you, I agree with you. But when you were growing up, you did not have a lot of friends because you were on the road. Um, your life certainly wasn't like most people growing up because you weren't in school and you, you didn't have friends of your age. But I hear that your first date in reading your book, because you're known as a ladies' man. You know, I know you're very happily married now, and, and uh, we're going to talk about that. But your first date, you said, forgot you in a movie theater? <laughs> yeah. Uh, it was strange, because relationships in show business, see, you didn't say dates. You'd go out after the show. If there was a young person on the show or somebody near your age, you'd go out. And you'd have coffee or you'd go catch a movie or whatever. But to date a person who was none show business, who was a civilian, was the strangest thing in the world, you know. And I had this date and I lost her in the Capitol Theater in New York. And we got mixed up in this big theater. <laughs> and I don't know 
and it was hours before we found each other and all of the rest of it, but uh, which taught me sort of a lesson, stick to the, the people in the business, because at least we had ways we knew where to go, you know, but it is a funny thing about that whole, the whole thing of dating and relationships when you're in show business. There is a difference, because in those days, particularly as a young man, I, if you didn't talk show business to me, I knew nothing else to talk about. So there was a there was a minimum of talk, you know. You sit and and you feel uncomfortable. She's uncomfortable being with with me. I'm uncomfortable being with her because we lived in literally two different worlds, you know. Well, uh, but I was just thinking your world now is so different too from other people's worlds. You have become a superstar and have been for a long time. I'm sure that this girl who lost you in the movies has, <laughs> you know, to this day said, how could I do it? Something like that. Uh, she probably uh, says, that, that, that guy <laughs> that lost me in the movies looks a little something yeah, like right. it. Right, okay. But uh, speaking about bad experiences, actually you had um, an experience that was not so terrific when you entered the Army at age 18, drafted during the war. First time I understand that you came across prejudice and hate. Well, it was uh, it was blatant, you know. And but the only reason I'm hesitant about answering it, I don't want any of your viewers to think. Uh, fortunately, in the book, they, the people who read the book didn't think it. Uh, but I wouldn't want anyone to think that I was any different than any other colored person at that point, and that was the terminology then. Uh, man, if you were black and you, and you got drafted in the 40s in the Army, all of us went through it. Uh, I, I was perhaps luckier to be able to be in a position to explain it in terms of celebrity, because I became somebody so I could talk about that. But more of the cats that really suffered were the guys who went and had to live through it, who didn't become the, quote, of the Sammy Davis Jr., or, quote, the Sidney Portiers, or Belafonte's. Uh, it was rough, because it was rough to me because I had lived in an isolated, insulated world, that of show business, and show business is twice removed from this. But then I came to realize in later years that even as a, as a show person, there was prejudice from the, from again, from the civilian population to the to the uh, military, there was there was prejudice. There's prejudice exists in all forms and all kinds. I had never been exposed to it, never been aware of it, because in show business, again, the camaraderie, the family ties, uh, of what one show person will do for another show person. But in those days, we had theatrical restaurants, we had theatrical hotels, and the non-theatrical places didn't want us, whether you were white or black. That's interesting. I want to talk more about that. We have to take a break now. Okay. But you know, with, with the army experiences, and I don't want to bring up the bad, the really bad experiences or bad memories, but they were horrendous. We're not yes. going to go absolutely horrendous. And reading your book, I was absolutely horrified. And and the fact that it did exist for the first time at eighteen, and then how it existed in show business. I'd like to explore that more when we come back. Okay. We're here at Harris Marina Hotel with my very special guest, Sammy Davis Jr. And we'll be right back after these messages. So please stay right there. We're back with my very special guest, Sammy Davis Jr. We're here at Harris Marina's Hotel in Atlantic City. We were just talking during the break, and I had told you personally, and I do want to also tell the audience, that your autobiography, Yes, I Can, was one of the best of its kind that I have ever written. Thank you. I learned so much about you, but I learned so much about what the world was like also in those days. It's another, it was another kind of, it seems to me sometimes, and I mean this, it seems to me that sometimes I think back to 20, 30 years ago, and it seems like another, uh, another planet, you know, and, and certainly by watching what's going on in the Olympics today, uh, and seeing the camaraderie between people, and the love, and the genuineness, and I keep relating back to things, and it's like deja vu and, and flashbacks, flash cuts, you know, and, and you see, only having lived there and being a part of now, can you see the improvement? The kid that's born today does not know about yesteryear, so he doesn't, he just has to deal with the problems of today, meaning that he will look at an older person and say, oh man, you don't understand what's going on. Uh, 
Okay, but it's important to know about yesterday. Of course it and is. And one of the things about yesterday, and I really, you know, but it's so important for me, and I learned so much in reading your book, and I guess that's why I want to talk about it, but when you started to become a star for the first time, that you were appearing in Las Vegas, where right now you probably are the biggest draw, and certainly here in Atlantic City, you know, if not the biggest draw, I, I, I don't even want to preface that, probably the biggest draw. You were performing in Vegas. You were allowed to perform on the stage where they cheered you, yet you were not permitted in the hotel. You were not permitted in the casino. Now, how could you go on stage and perform when you were being insulted off stage? It was, a, it was the rule. That was the name of the game, and that's what you had to do. And <coughs> if I had to go back and do that today, having now experienced the last 25 years, not because, again, of the celebrity or the position that I have, but uh, it would be terribly difficult, because now I know that that was wrong. But if you live in that world, mm -hmm. and that's the only world you live in at that time, and the whole world's like that, who's to come up and say that's wrong? So that it, it has to go over a period of time. The uh, Vegas was no different than Atlantic City. You know, I, we lived in a, uh, I lived off Kentucky Avenue, and uh, I remember the first time, and I was working at 500 Club for Skinny, and when you walked into the club, whether it was for Skinny or for any place, that was your bastion of freedom. But it, when you stepped outside, you, in no uncertain terms, you knew what the rules and regulations were, where you, and they were all unwritten. They didn't have the signs like the South, you know, no Negroes allowed and nothing like that. But you knew the signs were there. And every mm -hmm. black person that lived in this community knew it. You know, your world was here and there w the other world was there. And uh, never the Twain show meet except on, on the matinee show at the Club Harlem, you know. And then that was all fun. Then we all walked up and down Kentucky Avenue. But it was, there was a period of time and, and it shouldn't be forgotten because it, it makes you appreciate the struggles that everyone did, not just blacks, not just whites, but the combination of people caring about improving a situation. See, that's the most important thing, that it takes both together. Hey, man, this is wrong, and when it's basically wrong, what can we do about it? It's like everybody say, there's, a, there's an ailment, and you're in a hospital, and the person is sick. You don't care what that person is, or what he's, I gotta make him better. You know, and that's what happens to the ills of our society. True, and you were part of what made it better because you came back to Vegas. Obviously, things are different now, thank God. Uh, before you were talking about Skinny, I know you're talking about Skinny D'Amato. Actually, I've been to his house, a legend at the 500 Club in yeah. Atlantic City in those days, but you came back to Vegas. You were not only starring in one of the top hotels, you were finally staying in one of the mm -hmm. top hotels. You had a movie, you were on the top of the world, your life was wonderful, and then disaster your car accident. Mm -hmm. That must have been so difficult. You lost an eye. Um, you know, it's funny because you're not even aware of it looking at you, but how difficult was it for you to get back on the stage? It wasn't very difficult at all. Um, the difficulty of it didn't hit me until a year and a half later or so, because when you have family and you have friends around you who are rallying and supporting the, the euphoria of just being alive, you know, and that you'll be able to continue what you've done all your life to work. And, and uh, you know, it's like the doctor said to me in the hospital. He said, you know, you were, he said, well, when I was totally bandaged. And he said, you, so we had to remove your eye. He said, and your nose is broken. He said, again. And I said, mm. he said, but He said, but we'll have you back. He said, don't worry about it. You weren't that pretty to begin with. You know, so it was, it was as simple as <laughs> okay. that. Not as simple as that. Okay, you did come back to be an even bigger star and making more money, and we're going to talk about uh, the days you know, that, that uh, follow that and brought you to here now in Atlantic City after we take this break. We're here at the Harris Marina Hotel in Atlantic City with Sammy Davis, Jr., and we'll be right back after these messages, so please don't go away. We're back with my very special guest, Sammy Davis, Jr. We're here at Harris Marina Hotel in Atlantic City. And the time is going so fast for me. But 
in your first book, um, you wrote a lot about drinking Coke from a Coca-Cola from a silver goblet. Then in your second book, you talk about the booze and the drugs. Mm -hmm. When did the change start to occur for you? I don't know. I think it just goes with the territory, you know. The, the excitement, the trend of the times, whatever. Well, fast lane. All of, the, all of the things that have become cliches. You but, uh, no one's to blame, you know. I hate people who cop out for what they've done, you know. I wanted to do it, I did it. And if it's the fact the good Lord that uh, I'm the better for it having done it and uh, experienced it and made the choices, the, the proper choices, so that I can sit here today and uh, say without fear of contradiction that to experiment is one thing to get hooked if the experimentation leads to being hooked on anything whether it's alcohol abuse, whether it's drug abuse. If you want to be a wastrel, then go ahead. If you, if you want your life to mean something, then you better control it. You better be able, and since you can't, you better leave it alone. You know, the, at least in my case, that's okay, well, fortunately, you could control it. Fortunately, you are here today. But years ago, you tried to commit suicide. You tried yes. to take your car off a cliff. Mm -hmm. How do you bring yourself back to positive thinking Again, with the help of friends, it's the only thing. The help of friends and the help of, uh, you know, whatever you believe in, in terms of religion. Say you're the man upstairs, the fates, whatever you want to call it. Right. You've been married three times. The first time, uh, just to kind of sum up, when you were drunk, it was a mistake. You, you said you never should have gotten married. The second time seemed to have been a terrific marriage to no, my no. Brit. And uh, in your book, you really seem to have loved her so much. It was great love, but uh, the love of ambition was even greater and stronger in me. And she wanted, my, who was a very gracious lady, always, if my head had been where my head is now, we would still be together. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, it wasn't at that point. Uh, I still had things that I wanted to say performance-wise, and she had given up her career. And, she wanted an idyllic life. She wanted to be able to be restful. And, and I was just in the midst of just re, kind of re-establishing myself after Golden Boy. And I wanted to do films. I wanted to run. I wanted to do concerts and this, that, and the other. And that was the... And we saw it coming. And I couldn't make the break. She was not at fault. And rather than not to be friends, we decided to end it, as opposed to the thing we talked about in the beginning of the show. What makes your, your marriage now to Altavis? Timing, I guess. I guess it's all timing, really. And the fact that you care about each other. And certain values come into focus that at the particular early timing wasn't there before. And someone who knows your end of the business, you know, Altavis having been in clubs, been in this, been in that, she knows right. what I'm about. Yeah, right. And I hear it's, uh, you know, that there's a very special thing between the two of you now, but we only have 30 seconds left. You have had some wonderful things happen to you. You've been at the top and you've been at the bottom. If there's a lesson to be learned in, in your experiences, how would you sum up what would make us best understand Sammy Davis Jr., the man? I don't know. I, haven't, I wish I could come up with that marvelous catchphrase. I can't, but I can say one thing that I'm grateful grateful for all the good things that have happened to you. And the bad as well, because okay. they made me appreciate the good even more so. And I'm grateful that I got a chance to learn about you, to know you, and to have you on my show. Thank you and very I much. thank you very much for being here. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to know Sammy Davis Jr. I know that I certainly have, and that you'll join us again next week. Meantime, good night. It's been a pleasure getting to know you.